Hello and welcome to Dig School, cross-curricular learning themed around archaeology. This session is bird's eye views when we'll be seeing the bigger picture from above. Key questions will be how can non-digging approaches tell us about change over time? What resources are publicly available that anybody can use to do this? And why does this matter? Archaeology is often thought of as an underground thing, discovering buried remains, but actually looking from above discovers a whole new world. And in this session, we'll look at place names, old maps, aerial photographs and LIDAR, all of which have resources that anybody can access and use. So the first of those is place names, and it's really easy to overlook place names as a source of evidence. Um, any place has a name. And that name holds clues from the past. So have a think for a minute. Imagine you want to meet up with a friend, but you don't know where they are. How might they describe where they are so that you could identify it and find it? Just talk about that quickly for a few minutes and think about how you describe that place. So what sort of descriptions did you come up with? Was it um, at so-and-so's house? Good way to describe somewhere. Perhaps it was outside McDonald's. Place names develop for those exact same reasons, so that places can be identified and found. Most place names are based on two or three of the following elements. There's often a place, a personal name. Uh, it might say, this is so-and-so's farm or so-and-so's village. The second sort of element is habitative. It says what sort of place it is. Is it a village or a little outlying farm or a town? And the final element is topographical. It might describe where it is. It's the village under a low hill or the town by the ford across the river. Because this is the way place names develop, they can tell us something about the place's history, the place's character, what it was like, and about the landscape around it. So let's explore that a little bit. So there's a list of place names here. Some of them you'll have heard of, some of them you might not have done. They're all quite big places, quite well-known places. Um, in your booklet, you've got a list of those places, and I'd like you to write down what you think those place names mean. Now, to give you something to work with on this, here's a list of common place name elements. And most place names are made up of at least two elements, um, the bridge over such and such a river or so-and-so's farm. So for each of those place names you've got listed in your workbook, have a look down the list of names here and look for those elements. And you should be able to put them together and think, how does that make sense? If, if I was an Anglo-Saxon looking to name a settlement that I've acquired or inherited, how would I describe it? And how has that come to develop the place name there is today? And just as a hint, if you do get stuck on an element and it's not on that list, it may well be a personal name. Cernso's farm, for example, for example, would be something rather tun. So I'll give you as long as you want to think about that and write down your answers. So you've had a chance to work through all those place names, and I hope you managed to find most of the elements that make some sort of sense of them. So here they all are again, and here are the answers. Now, just, I won't go through every single one because you can read through them. Um, and you can write down the correct answer if you got it a bit differently when you were trying to work it out. You can see Birmingham, for example, the names are listed alphabetically. Birmingham, uh, the Homestead Village, that's the harm element. Um, uh, Bayorma, that's a personal name, that gives the berm bit. And then the in bit in the middle means of somebody's people. So it's the homestead village of Bioma's people. And that tells us something about how it was founded. It's a huge city today, but at one point it was a small village that was the central place 
for the group of people whose leader was called Beorma. Blackpool, that's an easy one to guess, simply means black pool. Uh, Barton on Humber, barley, that's the bar element, farm or village, the tun on the river Humber. Cambridge, bridge over the river Cam. Canterbury, fortification for the people of Kent, that's the bury element, means fortification. Derby, deer farm, the D-E-R is from deer, and B is the Scandinavian word for farm. And you can read through the rest of them there. Um, have a think about where you might have been misled or why you might have been dis misled. Now think of a couple of places near you, where you live, where you learn perhaps, um, and write down what you think their names might mean. Can you think of any places that have any of those same place name elements that you looked at when you were trying to puzzle out the list I gave you? Now you've done that, imagine you're founding or taking over a settlement. What would you call it? How would you construct a name from it? Perhaps using some of the same ideas or even some of the same words that people have used in the past. Write that down in your workbook and say what it means. So we'll move on now because actually for any place name, for most of the place names you'll have thought of, there may well be somewhere that actually you can really easily find out what it means because the University of Nottingham has a big website where you can simply type in any name. So for example, Aylesby, uh, the meaning is there, it's a personal name, plus that B element again, meaning farm of. It's a Scandinavian place name, and that's just giving us a little bit of a hint about its history. You can actually search on this by county. So you can literally uh, click on uh, click on the list, just select any county. This is Leicestershire here in the middle of England. Um, and each red dot shows you a place name that's recorded on that, on that website. And you can actually explore it by language. We've already looked at Aylesby and thought about the fact that, that that's a Scandinavian name. And you might think, well, why have settlements in England got names from Scandinavia? Um, and of course, they relate to the period when large numbers of Danish settlers were coming over and living in particularly in eastern England. So what you can actually do on this website is go through language by language. So for Leicester here, these are all the names that are just the Celtic names. You can see there's very few names have survived from the Celtic period. That's the pre-Roman period. It's not to say that Leicestershire wasn't densely settled then, it certainly was, but those names haven't survived. Those places have either moved and been refounded elsewhere, or the names changed. Going into Old English, we can suddenly see this seems to be the period when most of the places that are known by a name today acquired that name. So Old English is the period sort of up to about the 11th century, um, the sort of period of uh, um, King Alfred, Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon period. So we can see how many settlements are gaining their names at that time. Then we can look at Old Norse and actually see there's really quite a lot of places that have acquired names from the Old Norse. That again, that's the Scandinavian place name element coming over from the other side of the North Sea with those Danish settlers. Um, some of those places may already have had Old English names being given by the Anglo-Saxons, but they acquire a new name. Instead of being somebody's turn, they become somebody's be. Again, a completely new name. It's a Scandinavian person's farm, no longer an Anglo-Saxon settlement. And then into the Old French, and this is interesting because there's so few of those. Uh, the Norman uh, conquest, of course, brought in another sort of different set of uh, people in charge. But they seem to have had very little impact on the names of settlements. The existing names went on continuing in use. So you can see from this how place names give us that little extra window into the past. 
um, just as the examples. Uh, so it's a place called Ugly in Essex. Brilliant name, you might think. Well, it's obviously just not a very nice place. Um, but it's just not that simple. It is a very nice place. And when we look um, in this website at the meaning of that, we can see there's a personal name um, and Lea, uh, which means a clearing in woodland. So we can tell from that that we've got an Old English personal name uh, and that it's a place that's in a clearing in woodland. That implies that the area around it was then wooded. So in the Anglo-Saxon period, when the place acquired its name, when that uh, personal name developed, Uggers, uh, when Ugger acquired that estate and it became known as Ugger's settlement in a clearing in woodland, it was a heavily wooded area. And just as another example, North Ferrelby, um, very different places, is up in Lincolnshire. Um, uh, the, the ferry, uh, that gives you the ferry element of the name, so a boat. Um, and that be a place name. So this means there's, it's the farm by the ferry. And that tells us there was a ferry across, presumably, the Humber at that time. So you can reconstruct quite a lot from these place names. What we're now going to look at is maps. Now, these are another source of evidence that the way you're really you're looking from the outside, from above, down onto a settlement. So here is a map of a place called Scampton. And in fact, you can check on place names and it's Scammy's farm settlement. Scammy is a Scandinavian personal name, um, but it's got that turn, the Anglo-Saxon settlement name. So it sounds like it might have been a bit of a, a mixture, perhaps. Perhaps there's uh, uh, Norse populations and Anglo-Saxon ones both living there, or maybe the name just doesn't get completely changed. The map you can see there is from the 1980s and it shows the settlement pretty much as it is today. Here, you can see the map in the 1880s. Now that's a hundred years ago. So have a look at those two maps, which are in your workbook, and just do a spot the difference. Have a look at the earlier map, compare it with the modern one, see what's changed, what's stayed the same. Uh, put circles around anything that's changed and write some notes on it so you can remember what's been going on. So you've had a chance to have a look at this map and see the similarities and differences. Um, you can see, I think, that the, um, there's a new road has come through. Certainly, that's the most obvious new thing. And that's quite interesting because often roads are quite stable. They're often quite old. They don't change very much. But here, a new road has come through, sort of cutting through the settlement. Um, and there's a little bit more in the way of new houses appearing um, sort of at the top of the map. Apart from that, it hasn't changed a huge amount. So it looks like a fairly stable place over the last hundred years. So we can see something about recent change from these maps. Now, this is a very different place. This is a place called Bletchley. Um, that means Blecker's Woodland Clearing. That's very much an Anglo-Saxon name. Blecker is an Anglo-Saxon name. And again, it's that layer element, uh, the woodland clearing. Um, so here's Bletchley in the 1880s, and you can see the layout there. And here it is today. So it looks very different. But you've got your eye in, in looking at change before and after, spot the difference um, through looking at Scampton. So have a close look at this and look for the similarities and difference. What elements from that 1880s map can you see that are still continuing into the present day? OK, so you've had a chance to have a look at that. And I think you can see that, that actually, in this case, the roads are almost the easiest bit to use as an anchor. You can see the road coming in from the left and the one curving up from the bottom of the map uh, where they meet in the centre. You can see those roads are still there. Um, you can see some of the buildings are still there, some of the buildings around the crossroads 
Um, it seems such a major feature of the map in the 1880s, where all the roads met in the centre with that little green, that little open space there. Uh, that open space has been sort of taken up by encroachment onto it, and there's just a, a crossing now. Um, but you can see how the, the settlement has grown up around that, and that crossroads no longer looks such a centre. And in fact, if anything, it looks like there's more settlement uh, over to either side. There's lots of terraced housing has been built and um, lots of um, housing along various streets. And you might look at that map today, the 1980s map, and look at that and think, well, this is a heavily built up area. There's no way I can find out about what it's like in the past. But even just going back 100 years, in many places, they've changed a huge amount in the very recent past. So maps can be a hugely useful source of information to try and find out about how a place near you might have changed over time. And right at the moment, because of the coronavirus pandemic, um, Digimap for Schools is actually available for any school free of charge. So if you want to have a look at earlier maps, if your school is registered, have a look at that website. And if it's not registered, get in touch with your teacher and ask them to register. It's free and any school can register. So have fun having a look at maps. We're going to have a short break now and then we'll come back for part two. OK, so for part two of Up, Up and Away, we're going to look at aerial photographs. It's another way of looking at a settlement from above to try and see the bigger picture. Now, a decade ago, it was virtually impossible to do this for most people. But nowadays, again, online, there are a huge number of resources where you can find aerial photography. There's Google Earth here. You can go anywhere in the world and have a look at it from the air. The place we're going to look at is a place called Bustlingthorpe. Um, this is what it looks like from the air. You can see it there. It looks another tiny place like Scampton, even smaller, probably. And here are the maps and the place name. The place name is interesting. Bustling's outlying farm settlement. Thorpe is that outlying farm settlement. That's what Thorpe means usually means very small places and there are no big important places anywhere in England that have Thorpe as a place name element. None of the big cities, none of the really big places have that as their place name. They tend to be marginal outlying places. But Bustling Thorpe's interesting. It's, it comes from Bussellins, Bussellin, um, it's a farm settlement. It's a French name. And that's unusual, because remember, when we looked at that map of Leicester, very few French place names. So interesting that somewhere that's quite as out of the way as Bustling Thorpe should actually be one of the very few places with a French Norman place name. And in fact, we know roughly when that changed, because it was AC's outlying farm settlement. And that's a Danish personal name. So it was Aesthorpe up until after the Norman conquest, and then the name changes, probably from about AD 1115, when the new family, the Bousselin family, uh, acquired the manor and the name began to change. Probably coming just from common use, people had been calling it Isis Settlement for quite a long time, but it wasn't Isis Settlement for any longer, it was Bousselin's. Now, for people are just saying, well, where are you going? Where are you from? Oh, from Bousselin's outlying farm. That's just the way language changes by the convenience of people using it. So you've got two maps here. Have a quick look at these just on screen uh, to have a look at what's changed and what's stayed the same. So you've probably seen from that that rather like Scampton, not very much has changed. It does look really quite similar. Um, there's a few houses have appeared um, just on the left hand side of the village. Uh, but apart from that, it really looks quite similar. And when we look at the aerial photograph, it seems quite similar as well. But when we zoom in a bit and look a bit closer at that aerial photograph and tweak the colours and the contrast a little bit, and again, that's so easy to do on computers now, 
can see actually there's a bit more of a hint of change in the past than we could find from either the maps or place name evidence, particularly in this area circled in red, where you can see all those sort of irregularities showing in the fields there. And that's because you've got sunlight, low sunlight, you can see where the shadows are falling because you can see where the shadows from the trees are. It's always a good clue if you're looking at aerial photographs and looking for humps and bumps in the ground that may be the remains of old roads or house platforms or ditches or banks or buried walls. Um, if the sun is low, uh, they will throw a shadow and you'll be able to see those humps and bumps. And that's what's showing up inside this red oval here. Um, and you can also see, I think, just the, the bottom edge of that red oval, there's a whole load of, sort of, load of sort of parallel lines, as if someone sort of done a whole load of parallel scratches, as it were, down the landscape. Um, now, that's very close to the rest of the village, suggests it might be associated with it. And those parallel ridges there are classic. They're signs of medieval field system. So that suggests it might be something to do with a medieval village. But there is as well another source now for looking at aerial images that can give you an even clearer image. If you've got humps and bumps in the ground where you might have had a settlement in the past, but there's no record of it on the maps and the place names don't tell us precisely where anything was. This other source is LIDAR. Now, LIDAR is an acronym. It stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And it is a method of surveying the ground that involves taking a piece of equipment up into an aeroplane and then uh, taking readings onto the ground surface. Now, these readings are laser readings, so they're just beams of light. The equipment measures how quickly that beam bounces back effectively. Um, because it's light, it will bounce back off anything and everything it hits. So if it hits a tree, it'll bounce back more quickly because it's not going as far down to the ground. If it gets down to the ground, it'll bounce back. If there's a ditch, it'll take fractionally longer to bounce back because the ditch is lower on the ground. LIDAR is fantastically useful for archaeology. Um, it's useful for a lot of other things, but for our point of view, it's useful for archaeology because it gives us very precise measurements about quite how far away from that aeroplane the ground surface is. So we can get very detailed contour images, contour showing the sort of rises and falls in the ground surface. So when we're looking at Bustling Thorpe, um, we can see that, again, is that, that image of those, um, those humps and bumps, those uh, corrugated lines, those parallel lines, which are medieval field system. And the other slightly uh, more irregular sort of, what do I see, those little rectangles, perhaps. Um, we can see those from the aerial photograph. But the LIDAR image for the same site shows those same features much, much more clearly. And this is just from the publicly available resource, uh, which you can get at www.lidarfinder.com, which again, it's a publicly available site. Um, that's a bit hidden this, not everywhere is covered, but if the place you're looking at is covered, you can get a fantastic amount of information. And I think you can see comparing those two images, uh, you might think a color image will be clearer, but the the, it's the precise measurements in that LIDAR map are giving us a huge amount of extra detail. Now, what that immediately starts to look like is a medieval settlement. Um, and if you've seen them before, you know that's what they look like, and particularly associated with those medieval field systems, you get those, those parallel lines. You think, oh, yeah, that looks like a bit of medieval settlement. Um, and in fact, this one was so impressive that um, a few years ago, um, some archaeologists actually did a detailed survey of it. This is before LIDAR had been developed. And in those days, the only way you could record a site like this was by going across it and actually measuring the humps and bumps on the ground. So you can see here, you've got the plan on the right and the LIDAR image on the left. So have a look at these compare the photo with the plan and draw onto the photo in your workbook 
all of the features you can see on the plan. Have a very close look and see if you can pick out all of those features on the photograph. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So I hope you found you were able to spot most of the features shown on the plan on that LiDAR photograph, that aerial photograph. Now, once we've got all these features recorded, of course, then the next question is, well, what are they? What do they mean? We're trying to understand the past. Um, we want to know what they mean. Now, analysing this gives you a chance to think about what these features are. So the rectangle outlined here, and I expect you picked that up quite easily. It was quite a, a noticeable feature. That's a group of medieval strips bundled together. Each um, peasant family was given a collection of a, a scattered set of strips so that everyone got a share of good and bad land. But those strips were grouped together in small small sort of furlongs, and this is one of those sort of very small fields. There will be no uh, hedges or, or fences or anything between those fields. They're all completely open. So you've had a chance to have a look at all those features on the plan and see if you can match them up with features on the LiDAR photograph. And you can see how some of them are more pronounced than others, uh, and you can get a feeling for sort of what's there. But of course, what we're interested in is what does it all mean in terms of what can it tell us about the past of that place? We can't dig it, so we can't date it necessarily. But can we say something about what it was like? So looking at all those features, did you have any ideas about what might, what any bits of it might have been? where different people might have been living, for example, where was the Lord living, where were the peasants living in that village? Have a quick think about that, and then we'll have a look, about, look at some of the key features. Any thoughts about where the, where the Lord might have been living? So it's quite difficult to tell that sometimes, um, but because we've got this plan, uh, people have analysed this, and these are the key features that are present. Um, so the biggest and most impressive one are the two ones that are outlined in purple there. Um, they're both moats. Now a moat is a wide, shallowish ditch that would have been filled with water. They're a classic medieval status symbol. Uh, lords often put moats around their houses um, and the sort of complex where they're not only their house but uh, all of the other buildings that they would have had, a barn to store their grain, a, a smithy perhaps even, uh, um, other buildings, a detached kitchen, all everything that was to do with the lord's household, they'd have a big moat around it, partly for defence perhaps, probably more for status than anything else. It was what you had if you could afford it uh, or if you were um, uh, of sufficient status. It may have been an aesthetic thing so that your house could be reflected in the water. It would have provided a convenient source of water as well for washing or perhaps even for fishing. Here at uh, Bustling Thorpe, there's even a second moat. That might have been a sort of detached garden. Um, but we can see it's quite an impressive site. And again, we think of that Boussolin family inheriting that site or taking over that, that site, perhaps in the 12th century, and building this moat. Most moats do date to the 12th or 13th century. We've established that from excavation. So it looks like we can see the Boussolin family busy making their mark on Bustling Thorpe. And maybe that was one of the reasons it changed its name, because they were very busy in their local place. They really made a difference. We can also see there's two buildings. Uh, the only buildings of any great antiquity are the manor house, which is in the middle of the moated site. Actually, the manor house today is, is a, a relatively modern building, but it's almost certainly on the same site as the medieval one because it's in the middle of the moat. The other old building is the church that you can see marked in red. Now that's just outside the moat, but it's very close. It suggests the Lord had quite a lot of control over the church. And what you can also see is a load of hollow ways. 
Now, Holloway just means street. Um, and having had a look at that LIDAR photograph, uh, you can see how these streets are hollowed uh, as people use them year after year after decade into centuries even. The ground gets worn away through the constant walking and they develop a hollowed uh, shape. Um, so you can see there's a number of Holloways sort of snaking their way through the village and they're the most recognisable features because they're the most uh, clearly defined. And of course, there's also those ridges of those medieval fields, both um, to the bottom of the settlement on the south side and up at the top as well. So the next challenge is to think about where everybody else was living. We've identified the Lord would be in the church, uh, and the Lord would be in the manor house rather, and the priest would be living perhaps in a small building near the church. Um, where did everybody else live? So what I'd like you to do is have a look at that plan and the LIDAR photograph, whichever you find the easiest, and try and work out where the peasant families were living. Now, we know from Doomsday Book, there are 12 villagers and two freemen recorded. Now, each of those would have had a family and to accommodate that family, they'd have had a cottage uh, that was set within a plot of land that would be have any sort of, you know, outbuildings, uh, someone to keep the pig perhaps, and a little bit of land to grow their vegetables in, a little bit of enclosed land. The rest of the fields are very open and shared out um, but these little sort of paddocks are little private spaces. These sort of combination of cottage and paddock they're usually rectangular, often the cottage will face onto the street uh, and then the paddock will extend out behind it and this cottage and paddock thing is called a toft. Um, we come across these very often these tofts so have a look at the plan and see if you can work out where 14 of those tofts could have been fitted in. Can we fit them? Can we fit those earthworks, that, those visible remains today that have been recorded by the incredibly modern technology of satellite uh, machinery? Can we relate them to the Doomsday Book record a thousand years before? So have a think about how those are fit in. I've sort of marked up one here at the top of the page there. You can see that. That looks like a fairly clearly defined one. If I take that off, you can see it there. And there it is on there. So have a think about where those might have been. Uh, so there's one that I put on here to get you started, just up in the top of the map there. And you can see that's quite well defined if I take that off and put it on again. You can see where that is and hopefully you can match that up again to the LIDAR photograph. So take as long as you want to work out where 14 families, 14 tofts with a cottage and a paddock could have fitted. Um, and what trace have they left? So fit them into the remains that we can see there. So how did you get on fitting those 14 tofts in? Now, it can be a little bit of guesswork, um, but really it's only by making guesses and seeing how your ideas work out that we can really start to interpret what's going on. So my interpretation is that an arrangement like that seems quite likely. Um, medieval villages of this sort of date are often very regularly planned, particularly if you've got quite a controlling lord, and it seems like we might have had uh, at uh, Bustling Thorpe. Um, so what we've got here are the 14 tofts uh, laid out in two rows, sort of facing each other, either side of the space in the centre that has the manorial site, the Lord's house with those two moats and the church. And they're providing the core of the settlement. They're probably the earliest bit that the church and manor uh, founded there by the Lord. And then the settlement has been laid out in a nice orderly plan either side of it. 
and the hollowways, those streets, are giving access to it. So the tofts are opening onto those hollowways. And there's some sort of open space in the middle. There's a sort of large village green, perhaps where the village livestock might have been kept to keep them safe, uh, where people would have met and gathered and spent time. Um, and that as well, again, is close to the church and to the manor house. Now, of course, that arrangement doesn't account for all of the humps and bumps that we can see on the plan and the LIDAR image. And that suggests that this village has changed over time. We can fit those 14 tofts in, but we've got some sort of spare space. So what probably happened is as the population grew, we know from documentary records and from looking at pottery finds and so on, that the population did grow hugely uh, across the country. Perhaps it tripled uh, between the Norman conquest and two or three hundred years later. So we'd expect bustling thought, even if it was that outlying farm, that thought settlement, we'd expect it to have grown, and particularly with a very engaged lord like uh, Buslan. So perhaps the rearrangement changed. Perhaps some of those tops were adapted to make space for more people. So perhaps we ended up with something like that. We can see again that fits the earthworks, the humps and bumps, doesn't account for all of them. So what we've got in those humps and bumps is one layer of activity leaving one set of humps and bumps and then some changes come in on top of that and some of the original humps and bumps, the uh, walls and the uh, ditches between the different properties have been removed, but others have survived. So perhaps we can see the village changing over time in that way. And of course, the enigmatic area is right up in the top right hand corner where those ploughed out remains are. We can see there was no features visible um, when the survey was made or some very faint features. Um, survey notes that the remains were ploughed out. And we can see from the LIDAR photograph as well that there's nothing showing there now. Sadly, we can also see that actually on the bottom left hand corner, where there were ridge and furrow, those ridges, those long parallel lines drawn on when the survey was made, which was about 20 or 30 years ago. Now, when you look at the LIDAR image in the bottom left hand corner, there's really no sign of those ridge and furrows surviving. They've been ploughed away over the last 20 or 30 years. So, that's taking you through some of the sources and some of the approaches and how to use that evidence for looking at a settlement from above, a place from above. Um, so it could easily go straight over to you. You've got the place name data that you can study for any place you care to think of. You've got the Digimap evidence for the older maps. And then you've got the aerial photographic evidence from sites like Google Earth and Find My LiDAR. So choose a place. Maybe you live somewhere. Maybe you go to school somewhere. Maybe you just know someone who lives somewhere. Pick a place and see if you can reconstruct something about its past from those different sources. And just write a quick summary of what you can say about it from those sources. So I hope you've enjoyed that dig school. We've looked at key questions. How can non-digging approaches help us understand change over time? And I think we've seen how uh, place names can tell us something about what places were like once and we can compare that today. That old maps can show us about recent changes, which we can compare to today, compare maps today to older maps. And then aerial photographs and features like LIDAR can show us some of the early remains that survive. And we know what resources are publicly available. And why does it matter? Well, because it's such a brilliant way of being able to put you in touch with a research project that you can do for yourself without even leaving your home or your school if you have access to a computer. So I hope you have a go and I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you for watching this issue of Dig School, Bird's Eye View, and I hope to see you at another Dig School in the future. Thank you.